go in English or in Luganda? Uh, I forget. Pastor Evelyn, we have a little bit of Luganda. To consider why? Because they say, let work here, Karubi. And to Banjiba in Giranga, Balina, and Nimia Zenja will look to Twilight Fenty, sing abroad, they can to Okay. Ah. In the last sharing, uh, last week, uh, I introduced, no, the question, the question that was asked was about uh, why is it that uh, intercessors end up as causalities of, 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 of their prayers. Um, now, I, I started on the first part of understanding uh, how we pray. I explained that there are two ways we pray. The first type of prayer is the one which is directed to God. You speak to God. The second type of prayer is you speak to Satan. When you speak to God, you, any, any child of God, even non-believers can speak to God anytime. There are not so many effects to your prayer, especially when you're praying to God. Say, for example, the prayer of faith. You ask God for something you believe that he has given it to you. You thank him. Prayer of faith. For example, you want to be healed. That is a prayer of faith. And uh, other types of prayers, like petitions and intercession. In intercession, you are speaking to God about somebody else. That is a prayer of intercession. Now, there are many other prayers, prayer of faith, prayer of worship, prayer of praise, prayer. Those we are speaking to God. But the prayer that is uh, important to understand is the prayers that involve spiritual warfare. These are the prayers that result in being hurt, people being exposed, intercessors being affected. The effect to an intercessor comes in areas where the intercessor has gone beyond these lines of responsibility and therefore his line of authority. When you go beyond your area of assignment, your area of responsibility, it means you've gone beyond the area level of your authority. And there you are exposed. So I took time, first of all, to explain these areas of authority so that we understand them. Because you cannot go beyond the authority of a particular sphere unless you know and understand that sphere, where it begins and where it ends. What authority do I have over other people? What authority do I have over my children? What authority do I have over my employees and so on? So we first of all decided that we wanted to understand the levels of authority, how they relate to us. Because when you understand, when we fully understand what these levels of authority and their limitations are, then we will live and use the authority best on our, based on the, the authority, based on the responsibility given to us. 
there we are safe. We are within the limits of our authority. We are within the limits of our responsibility. So that's why we decided to start with understanding the different levels of authority. So here on the screen, you have the first three being divine and the other four being human. So it's a total of seven different levels of authority in which we operate. And so when we looked at the, the sovereign authority, we, we saw that this is the area that is only reserved for God, our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The same with the Velasius authority, which refers to the authority of the truth. The truth has authority. Anywhere you find it, whether it is in science, whether it is gravity, whether it is uh, the laws of motion, any truth, wherever it is, has authority. Truth in any expression has authority. So that is the Velasquez authority. Then we looked at the authority of our conscience. Your conscience gives you, uh, tells you what is right and what is wrong. That conscious authority every human being has. You have authority over your own life, whom to praise, whom to worship, whom that, that is the authority of your conscience. You have a right to exercise your conscience. Uh, the conscience is the part which God gave every person, uh, every, every individual. It is not just for a few people, it's for all people, but it is on the level, divine level, because it's the part of God which constantly tells you what you're about to say is wrong, what we're about to do is wrong. Don't do it. The other four delegated authorities, stipulated or contractual authority, custom or traditional authority and functional authority are on the human level. God has delegated some of his authority to humans so that they can use it in their respective areas or callings. What will be happening to many of you as you come to know the Lord better and better, you enter into the calling that God has given you. You start to appreciate the key positions, the key uh, call, the key calls that God has put on your life. And then you will yield to that. You will uh, yield to God's spirit. And then you enter into that authority of a delegated, a delegated authority. You become God's delegate. You own, you hold in your hands the authority, an authority that is not yours, but you're just a, a steward. So these four uh, areas where we steward the authority that God given us, God has given us. So we we looked at that in the uh, uh, the sharing that we, we did. I don't think I'll go back in the, the details, but uh, at least for those who are joining us today, we are looking at those four different, I mean, the seven different sources of authority. And look at them that, for example, the sovereign authority, God exercises absolute, infallible, and the highest in the Middle East, and sorry, in the universe. This authority belongs exclusively to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is authority exercised by only God. God has overall power, absolute power over any individual, over every individual in the universe. Then we saw the Velasquez authority of truth, the authority of truth. 
then the authority of our conscience, everyone being accountable based on their conscience, and the fact that no one has a right to violate each one of us conscience. Because that is the part of God watered by his word, the word that uh, we live with every day. So that is veracious, the authority of God. The authority, the delegated authority, refers to authority that we have, we have been uh, 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 delegated. We, we, when you talk about or think about uh, a situation where you have people under you, where you have responsibility over those people, like uh, a father, like a mother, like a parent, like a pastor, that is delegated authority. It's the authority of God that has been delegated to us. We can use it. We can use that delegated authority in our individual life, corporate life, business life, church life, ministry life, national life, civic life. We have delegated authority, authority that have been given to us uh, <coughs> from God. It comes from God. It's a delegated authority from God. Then we saw the institutions of delegated authority. We saw the institution of family, of marriage, of education, of marketplace, of local church, of the state. These and the leaders thereof collect God's dues of obedience so that we can remain under authority. These institutions and God, <coughs> the God is delegate. They collect God's dues of obedience, God's uh, uh, dues of, of submission, and in so doing, you, when you obey them, when you submit to them, you are submitting to God. God put it that way. When you submit to them, who's, uh, uh, who, who, who gets blessed? It is you. The blessing is yours. So we have the family, where you have the father and mother, and the respondents are children. Marriage bond is the husband who is under that it is the wife is under that authority of a husband. Um, education, teachers, lecturers, pupils, and students. You indulge students, uh, they will <coughs> refer to their lecturers, to their teachers as the authority. So at the business place, that is marketplace leaders, they refer to their bosses or uh, uh, the, 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 the marketplace boss, he occupies an office, an office to which the employee responds. So the, on the left, you have the institution. In the middle, you have the agent or the officer. For the officer, that means he occupies an office. On the right, you have the respondent, the one who responds or obeys that authority. Now that is, this is a very important part when it comes to the delegates. So I, I, I shared in that uh, uh, sharing that when we read the book of Ephesians, for example, where Paul is explaining uh, how we do spiritual warfare. Remember these Ephesians where people whom Paul had spent almost three years with. He was there, he taught, and after he taught, there was a, an unusual uh, 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 move of the Holy Spirit in the city of Ephesus. And the people were getting healed left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. They were being saved, miracles were happening, and all of a sudden there was a riot. Alexander the Copper Smith raised dust that this man Paul is taking our people. And in Ephesus, there was a huge temple of the goddess Diana. And so that riot caused Paul to have to walk away and leave that place. 
to go to the next place. So when he talks about this, he knows that the Ephesians understand that their fight is not just the people like Alexander the Coppersmith, nor those people who are priests of the uh, of the uh, of Diana goddess, but behind there was a spirit. So he he's talking to people who already understood when he was there. This is what had happened. There was a, a, a riot. This riot was caused by the principalities and powers in the heavenlies, which did not want Paul to continue uh, preaching and teaching the gospel, the word of God. So he is explaining, therefore, how to do spiritual warfare. And we uh, basically read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, to chapter 6, verse 12. In those verses, Paul is explaining the principle that uh, we, the principles that we must observe in order to do effective spiritual warfare. And we, in verse 18 it says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we started there. We said that you cannot do spiritual warfare in the flesh. You have to do it in the spirit. Therefore, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because spiritual warfare, as it is, it is spiritual, therefore you do it in the spirit. And this time, it is the Holy Spirit that you have to be filled with. Because it is only he who actually does the warfare, spiritual warfare. So you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, uh, we saw that after you are filled with the Holy Spirit, there are signs. One of the signs is that you start speaking in psalms, in hymns, in songs, in you know, songs of the Spirit, singing songs and music in your heart is one of the signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you are going to do spiritual affair, Ensure that you are in the spirit. You are singing, you are praising. You are on. We saw again that in order to excel, to be able to do spiritual warfare effectively, you have to praise. We saw the area, the importance of praise, because praise puts us in the position of warfare. It puts the sword of the spirit in your hands. When you start to praise, that praise puts a sword, the sword of God, the sword, that is the word of God, in your hands. And the Bible clearly says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and the two-edged sword in your hands. So praise puts a sword in your hands. You get the sword of the spirit when you praise. The praise puts that sword. So the praising here, singing song becomes a very important part. And verse 20 says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 21, we get to the very important part, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So those four verses are important. Verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, when filled with the Holy Spirit, speak, sing, psalms, hymns, and speak your thanks. Verse 20, you must be filled with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is an important part of spiritual warfare. Mm. My network, I don't know whether I'm, 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 am I audible enough? Can I, can you people hear me? Yes, sir. Because we are moving, I wanted to be sure that you I'm still on. You are still on, Sebo. You can still hear me. Yes, sir. 
tubadde mujamu tuli mujamu nga munji bulala tutambula na network i wanted to be sure that we are i'm, I'm, I'm still you can still hear me so uh when when it comes to verse 21 uh, Paul is now emphasizing that after you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are singing, you are praising, you must be sure, uh, sure that you are fully submitted to God's delegates. You must be, you must ensure that you are uh, under authority because you are going to exercise authority. To exercise authority, you must be under authority authority. So verse 21 highlights that. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. A very, very important verse because after that, the next verses, he starts now to explain uh, those uh, people, the ones you submit to. Here, he says, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. See Christ in those delegates. That's where the, that part, the blue part is, out of reverence for Christ. You submit to other people seeing them in that area. So we went through that, which I'm not going to go through now. We saw that wives submit to husbands, husbands, you love uh, children, obey your fathers, fathers don't exasperate your children. Uh, and we saw that direct line of authority from God through Christ, through a husband to a wife, then God, Christ, parents and children, then God, Christ, uh, your boss, and then the employee. Uh, these are the lists that Paul is saying. Uh, God, Christ, pastor, believer. Then we saw God, Christ, teacher, a student, then God, Christ, those who are in authority, like the president and others, and then the citizen. So we looked at those delegates in the various areas. The emphasis there is that submit yourself then to God before you resist the devil. It's the, the, the point Paul is raising which James also raises in James chapter 4, 7. Paul says, submit one to another. That is a very important principle before you exercise authority. So be under authority before you exercise authority. Be under authority before you can be in authority. Being in authority requires that you are under authority. Okay, so that was the point. And then we saw 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to uh, six, uh, it says, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So these two verses here are very, very important. In order to cause the devil to flee, you submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, then he will flee. It's only then that he will flee. So he will not flee if you yourself are not submitted to God. So James puts it that way. Paul puts it in another way. We will be able already to punish every act of disobedience once our obedience is complete. So both of these verses are talking about the same things, same thing, but using different uh, words. James is saying, submit yourself to God before you resist the devil. When you do, Submit to God, the devil will flee. You will resist the devil, and the devil will flee. Paul says, We will be ready to, we will only be ready to punish every act of disobedience once our obedience is complete. So they are talking about the same thing. Disobedience, remember, Satan's kingdom is built on rebellion, and the whole system of Satan is a system of rebellion. Okay, so then we see that after that, we see it is that submission. Uh, this Roman centurion uh, demonstrated when he came to Jesus. This centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant and said, Jesus, you don't need to come to my home. I'm not worthy. 
For I myself am a man under authority, and we emphasize the word under authority. He didn't say I'm a man in authority. He says I myself am a man under authority with uh, soldiers under me. So I'm under authority, and then the soldiers are under me. I want you to see those under. For him, he's under authority. The authority of this authority here is the authority of uh, uh, the emperor, the Roman emperor. At that time, it was Tiberius Caesar. So he's referring to the imperial authority of Caesar. I am under Caesar, but soldiers are under me. So I want you to see that. I am under the emperor, but soldiers are also under me. So I tell this one, go, and he goes. I want you to notice that for him, he realizes that the most important thing is that he's under Caesar. It's the first thing he mentions. As long as he's under Caesar, these soldiers will obey him. So that's the point. Submit yourself to God, then resist the devil. So once you are under authority, then you'll exercise authority. So I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one come, and he comes. I said to myself, and do this, and he does it. So he's saying, the only reason these soldiers obey me because I am under the authority of Caesar. This is very important here. When Jesus had this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So Jesus calls this faith, a lot of faith, because he says, this man has recognized that I've been sent by God the Father and I'm operating under God. So I can, because I'm obedient to God, I can command sicknesses, demons, and they leave. Now, you can imagine that uh, Jews could not appreciate this. Some of them said he's doing this because of Beelzebub. Many of them could not get healed because they did not see the authority of God in him. But this man could see the authority of God. Jesus is under authority. That's why he's commanding these sicknesses to go. So this is centurion is saying, the way you treat sicknesses, diseases, what is the way I treat my soldiers? I tell one, go, another one, come, and they come. You, you have authority over these elements, wind, you have power over rain, you have over, over, over uh, uh, you know, the climate, weather. So, so you are under God. So this is the principle which Paul has now finally made by what he has written in that passage. And that's why he says, finally, now that you are under authority, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can only be strong in the Lord when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you are filled with thanksgiving, when you are submitted to God, that's your strength. The strength of a believer in spiritual warfare is being under God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you don't, your strength, the strength you will be using in spiritual warfare will be just mere shouts. Shouting and shouting, it's not the amount of shouting that will move the demons. Shouting is the strength of food. When you eat a lot of calor, you can shout because you have a lot of uh, uh, guts. You don't need a lot, a lot of shouting. What you need is total, complete submission to God's delegates. Then you exercise authority. Then God is truth, veracious uh, uh, authority. Then God's, you know, the, the conscience, then the sovereignty. That is where you need you to get your strength. Now, we also looked at two main categories. One is that you have two levels of authority. One is a divine authority, which you are under to submit to. 
so that you exercise your gifts and then your personal authority, whether you're a delegate, whether you're a father, whether you're a husband, whether you're a wife, whatever. This is the one which comes from what, what God wants you now to, to use that authority for, to exercise the gift you are born with. This is your area of domain established by the creator for which he has designed and equipped you to perform. Every gift, every ministry you are doing is an area of authority in which God has allowed you to exercise that gift. Now, the parts, there are two parts, the one of God, where you submit, and then the, what, the part which you do. The part you submit to becomes very, very important. And we, we are going to, to, to spend a little bit more time on that one today. Now, pastor, personal authority is in your area of gifting. For example, a bird has a, a authority to fly. A fish has authority to swim. A bird has authority to fly. God has given it power within. And in that particular area, it, it has full authority. It can also be acquired by training, by any, in any given discipline. You can be a doctor and you have authority in that particular area. A lawyer and you have authority to operate there and so on. If you do what you are authorized, you are doing the right thing. But if you do what you are not authorized to do, it ends up affecting you. So when you come to spiritual warfare, every time you are in the area of your calling, you are safe. Every time you are in the area of your calling, you are safe. Paul, when he's talking about that, he says we, we, we did not go beyond, he was telling the Corinthians, that we did not go beyond the limits of our authority. We kept ourselves within the authorized area. But any gift that God gives you, any talent, any ministry God gives you, that ministry requires authority to function legally. Every gift, every ability needs authority to function. For example, look at your hand, wherever you are seated. That hand is, is, uh, is, is, is connected to your hand, that, that your, your palm, your fingers, your fingers, uh, your palm is connected to your arm. It is the arm that gives the authority to the hands to do what it's supposed to do because it gets sustenance to, in order to work. So suppose your palm is not connected to your hand. Well, how will it, will it manage, will it operate? No, it won't. And that's what we are talking about. That is the legal aspect of ministry. The thumb is connected to your palm and your palm is connected to your arm. Authority in the spirit realm in the body is like that. You get authority to operate in the body of Christ by you submitting to the right leadership. So the thumb submits to the palm, the palm submits to the arm, the arm submits to the shoulder. That's how authority flows. The same way we're looking, for example, at uh, uh, God, Christ, Pastor, believer, we're looking at that. God, Christ, your boss, employee. God, Christ, parent, children. Now, as long as the children are in the right place, they will operate. They will be safe. 
they will not have any problem. Now, the problem we have in church and the question which we are addressing, why do people get backfires in spiritual affair when they are involved in ministry, in prayer, in intercession? Why is it they keep getting backfires and they are hit and they are, uh, you know, they end up, you see, you find them and the eyes are red. And he says, I'm an intercessor, but their lives, you look at them and they are constantly being hit. Why? This is the issue. You are a finger connected to a palm. The palm is connected to the arm. The arm is connected to the shoulder. It is that order that enables the arm to operate rightly legally, to operate legally. So in the spirit and in the church, this is what many times it's lacking. When people have power, power gifts, power gifts make people feel or think that they don't need other people. So a thumb is highly gifted, think, ah, no, I don't need the palm. I don't need the arm. I don't need the shoulder. So the thumb goes out, attacks the devil without the palm, without the arm, without being on the shoulder. So that's what I'm talking about. Every power, gift, or ability needs, needs authority to function legally. That's how God has created the body. And most of the heart has come because of this. People who are anointed with gifts, but they are not ready to submit to other leaders. They are not ready to get to wait to get permission to operate or to function rightly and legally in the body. And they end up not only hurting themselves, but they also hurt the body. The whole church is hurt by these people. Power is the natural ability. That is the dynamic energy, that is the force. While authority is the legal right or permission to exercise that power. So the difference should be very clear. The case uh, not very long ago was brought in court. The man who was brought in court was called Chitata. Chitata with his, uh, what was they called? Bishop Bachita Tababa Tangabatia, border borders are Bajita Tangabatia. Twenty ten. Aha, border border twenty ten. That used to exercise a lot of power. Arrests, beats, what, what? Then one time he was arrested, taken to court martial. And then he was asked, where did you get this, that, uh, that uh, uh, pistol? I think he had a pistol. Yaninachi, pistol namundu, what, what was it? He okay, had a golden that... pistol. Uh -huh. golden. Mm. Now, that, that pistol, that gun represents power. So you can have power, but that power, is only supposed you only supposed to have it when you have the permission to use it. When you don't have the permission to use it, then it becomes criminal. And that is the point we are talking about. So he had the power, which is the gun, but he has he had no authority or legal right or permission to exercise that power. And that is the point I'm making. You may have a gift, an anointing, a gift to heal a gift to prophesy, so many of these gifts in the church, but without the legal rights. So the legal rights, where do I get it? You get it by submitting. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil and will flee from you. I'm a man under authority, therefore I can use authority meaning I can use the power that I have. So the power 
Chita Tahad, which is the gun, was illegally used, why he had it wrongly. So he should have had a uniform as a policeman or as an army. So the, the, the uniform represents authority. The badge of a soldier represents authority, while the gun represents the power. So we should never confuse power with authority. And we're not told in the Bible to pursue power because you potentially have it already by birth. It is already inside. Where God has already gifted you and called you, you already have it potentially in you. It is in, in there already. What we need to pursue is authority, learning to submit. So the first part of your life, the first three decades or so, God spends more time teaching you to submit. Almost three decades or more, God takes a long time helping us to learn to submit. Even Jesus took three decades. Can you imagine Jesus wasn't sinning, but he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. What was he learning? He was learning to submit. For some of you who doubt, let me show you that verse so that you may see that even Jesus, it took him three decades without sin. He didn't have any sin, but it took him three decades to be ready. Unbelievable. For some of us, it's almost unbelievable that Jesus would take three decades, three decades, 30 years preparing him. Look at what was it? He already had power potentially. What was he waiting for? Bishop, read for us. Who in the days of his flesh, that is Jesus, when, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, was able to save him from death mm -hmm. and was hurt because of his godly fear. He was what? He was hurt. Because of his godly fear. Mm -hmm. Though he was a son, mm -hmm. yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Mm -hmm. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now let's look at verse eight and nine. This is Jesus, the son of God. It says he learned obedience. You see, Jesus did not come with obedience from heaven. He learned it here. Did he need to learn it? Yes, because he came as a human being, was born as a human being, he ate as a human being, slept as a human being, got tired as, as a human being, he overcame. So Jesus had to go through everything as a human being, as a son of Adam, to get back what Adam lost. That was the key issue. Adam was given the earth. God gave the earth to Adam. Adam sold it out to Satan. Satan had this lease. So a human being had to get it back. That human being is Jesus of Nazareth. Not the son of the living God, but the son of man. In two, we have two, in one person, we have two people. One, the son of God, and the, 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 the son of man. So the son of God is the life of God. But the son of man is the son of the son whom Mary produced. So when Isaiah was talking about him coming, we see two people. Let me just read that for you so you can see it. You can also see it that you, are, you have two people in one. In one person, you have two people. One is human, another is divine. Say what, so Mary. For unto us a child is born. That one is human. Unto us a child is born, that is human. Mm. Unto us a son is given. 
that is divine. So you have the child of Mary, that is the envelope. Inside is the son of God. That one is given, that one is not born. What is he coming to do? The government will be upon his shoulder. That is the authority. That's why when he overcame, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So he's coming to do what? To take over government, to rule, to exercise authority. Okay, now let's go back. In order for him to be able to do that, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So that human man, that human Jesus of Nazareth, learned obedience, submission. He did it, he learned it through the things which he suffered. He did it long enough, 30 years, and got perfected. Having been perfected, now he was able to become the author of eternal salvation to all of us who what? Who obey him. Uh -huh. You see? The obedience is key. There are people who get saved, but they don't obey him, and they cannot see the authority exercised in their own lives. So the obedience part therefore becomes very, very, very critical. Now let's go back to what we were saying. I wanted to prove you from the scripture. So you can see that uh, you find you 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 we, we, you you get power. You're born with it. It's inborn. But the authority there is a learning process to get the permission. Power is right there. It is inborn, just like Jesus. The power was already, already there. But the in order to get the permission, it took thirty years. What was he learning? Obedience. When he learned obedience, do the things that he suffered, then now he has authority. He has, he has permission to exercise authority. Most people don't wait for that. They think, since I'm already prophesying, I'm already anointed, why should I need the church? Why do I need the pastors? Why don't, do I need to obey them? So that, that is the problem. So you, 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 you have the inherent power, that is the potential, but you take a process of being under authority, under your parents, under your tutors, school, lecturers, church, boss, civil leader, to, to grow in obedience in order that you get the permission to exercise that authority. That's what happened to Jesus. That's what happened to David. That's what happened to Joseph. That's what happened to Moses. That's what happened to Jeremiah. All these great men of God, they learned obedience to the things that they suffered so that they can get the permission to exercise the power that was already theirs by calling and by birth. Find those with authority and submit under them. You need to get under divine authority to function properly and be protected. Very important. When you do, whether you're an intercessor and you hear from God, you need to be under your pastor. Some intercessors don't because they keep saying, oh, from I hear from God, I, our pastors are not spiritual. You must operate under authority to be safe, to be protected. And I've seen so many. I've seen so many. I've been a pastor for many years, and I've seen how many people who shipwrecked their lives because they refused to listen to anybody. They walked away because they were, you know, when you are an intercessor, you spend a lot of time to, praying, and then you hear voices, and then you are, and then people who get into that, they end up saying, no, I don't need to listen to, to the pastor. For me, I hear directly from the Lord. And sure enough, maybe they do. But still, for them to exercise that gift, they still have to remain under authority. Where the pastor says, no, stop, you stop. Stop that one, you stop it. Go ahead with that, 
you go ahead. That is a test for you. Jesus, can you imagine Jesus lived with Mary, with Joseph, with all those people in Nazareth? Certainly was hearing from God every day, but he remained with them. And at them, the Bible says, when he was in the temple at 12, his mother came asking, why did we look for you? Jesus, you made us look for you. Why did you? And he said, why did you have to look for me, mommy? Darling, mommy, why did you need to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But the next verse says, he went back to Nazareth and obeyed them. You see that? He's supposed to be in the father's house, but the mother said, no, to Gendeka. Now Gendeka. That is obedience. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He agreed to go with them, even when he was supposed to be in his father's house. At that time, the mother, the father, are the ones that are in authority over him. He's under authority. So those are some of the things that he learned. He had to be in the carpentry workshop, making tables, making chairs, making beds, people shouting at him. And, and he, he had to endure all that, to be patient, even though he was the one who was going to save all of us. When I look at some of us these days, when if, if only God made you a, 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 our savior, I don't think even you would have washed, you would even have time to wash the cup that you have uh, uh, drunk from. You'd not wash your clothes. You'd not wash eh? even your plates. Somebody else will have to, because for you, you are, so, you are, going, you are here busy going to save the whole world. You have no time for those kind of things. Many of, work. <laughs> Many of us would be like that. Yeah? <laughs> you wouldn't wash your clothes. Somebody would have to wash your knickers and your underwear and your brows and your, yeah? You, somebody has to bathe you up because you are. <laughs> so <laughs> you literally would have to be uh, tiptoeing around when we know Juliet uh, uh, So you cannot have time for menu work, shipping the, eh, the kitchen, washing. Dishes, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy for that. I'm too... Jesus did all that. Jesus was been there in the carpentry, the dusty streets of Nazareth, working in the carpentry workshop. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. Why? So that he may get the legal rights, the permission, the permission to exercise the authority that he did. So when you see Jesus exercising that authority that he did, 30 years he was learning or getting the permission, three years he exercised it. 30 years of submission, of obedience, and three years of ministry. When you tell people today to wait, you say, no, 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 people are dying. You know, the whole world is going to hell. As if before they came, there wasn't any, <laughs> the world has been here long before you came. When you, are, you wait for the right timing, in three years, you can accomplish far more than what you would have accomplished in 30 years, if you went prematurely. So you can see Jesus spent 30 years in preparation and only three years in ministry, and after I did three years, he said, it is finished. I've finished my days. Why? Because he allowed God to prepare him. So look at how he starts his ministry. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. 
Then John consented. The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John is baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? So I want you to look at those two passages. What do you see in those passages? After 30 years, Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan and was baptized by John. John said, no, 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 no. You are greater than me. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I need to submit to authority. I have to be baptized by you. John, you've been the, the, the leader in ministry. I have to submit to your ministry. Let it be so now, because it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. That is the requirement for you, the permission for him to do ministry. Later on, when the chief priests and elders came to him to challenge where he got his authority, they are challenging Jesus, where did you get your authority to do these things? Who gave you this authority? What was Jesus' answer? Jesus' answer is John the Baptist. And look at how he put it. I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. First tell me, where did John's baptism come from? Was it from heaven or from human origin? This was very, very important. What is in the West telling them, let me first establish where did John get his authority? If you answer that it came from heaven, I'll tell you that John gave me the authority to, to what? To baptize. So what Jesus did was to jump the first part and go straight to the second part. I don't know whether you can appreciate why he's doing that. He, he's saying, in effect, John gave me the authority. But let me first ask, where did John's authority come from? So John's authority came from heaven. And the Pharisees knew it. That's why they didn't answer him. The next part says, if we say that it came from people, they will stone us. All of us know it came from God. Uh -huh. Now everybody knows he's brought John the Baptist into the picture. And after everybody is, is convinced John the Baptist came from heaven, if he, he did as he sure did, then I am right. Then I have authority because John the Baptist initiated me. So that's the whole po po point Jesus is making here. I'm here. I didn't just start myself off. John the Baptist initiated me into ministry. He authorized me into ministry. So where did John's uh, authority come from? Certainly it came from heaven. So if it came from heaven and he was a man of God and he authorized me, then what are you questioning? So that is the whole issue here. So God is not moved by your power. He's moved by your being under authority. Satan, likewise, does not fear power. He only fears authority because he knows he can get rid of you anytime if all you have is power. He has done that before. He has a, a, an experience of 6,000 years. Great men of God like Samson. Samson had power. But the moment he disobeyed God's veracious authority, the truth, and God's sovereignty, do not cut your hair, do not, well, the moment he did that, then he lost the authority. You can have power as long as you obey the sovereign, the veracious authority, and the authority of the conscious. As long as you remain in obedience to those three levels of authority, you will continue to have authority. Let me remind you of those three, especially. If, if you remain, you submit to the sovereign authority of God, 
the authority of the truth, and then obey in obedience to your conscience, then you can continue exercising your authority. Satan wants you to move away from being under authority. And this is how he can easily corrupt your gifts, that is your power, and end up destroying you, like he destroyed Saul and he destroyed Samson. He destroyed Saul because Saul refused to submit to his authority. His authority was Samuel. He refused. Saul refused to submit to Samuel. And by so doing, he lost the authority. He still remained in power as king, but he had lost the authority. Power was corrupted because he did not continue submitting. He remained in power. He was in, the, in power. He was, for the next 15 years, he was still in power. But he had lost the authority. The moment he lost the authority, the demon came and occupied him. Demons looked at him. He was still in power as king, but he had lost the authority. When you lose the authority, the devil is not afraid of your power because now he'll use that very power to destroy other people, to destroy you. He actually wants you to remain in power as long as you're not under authority because that works for him. Your power will, he will use that power to destroy people, to destroy so many things. People who have power, but not under authority, they become very, very dangerous in the kingdom of God. Such are Saul. Saul went and killed all the priests of God at Nob, 85 and their families. 85 priests were all destroyed and killed by Saul, who is in power, but with no authority. Samson, after he lost, he refused to submit to God, then lost the power. But I want you to see the difference between the two, because that is very crucial. That is very important. So I'll end there and give uh, back a uh, microphone to Bishop Kabuye for discussion. And the Yes. Yes, beloved. In light of the teachings we have received, do you have any question, members? I'm asking members. Any question, any area of clarification of what Bishop has shared with us? Please, you can put up your hand or unmute your microphone and speak. If you can't, you can chat. If the language is a problem, you still can, you can use any language, more especially if we can understand to express. Mm. Bishop, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, Evelyn. Yes, uh, Bishop, we are so, so very grateful. And uh, Bishop Kavye, must it be only a question or? Not a question. Not a question. Whether it's a question or comment. <laughs> OK, Not then. Um, Bishop, once again, I'm saying thank you so very much. I've enjoyed last week and today. Uh, it has been so edifying for all of us. Now, we, uh, Bishop has been uh, trying to answer. He has answered the question why we get backlashes, why we get uh, 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 tormented by the devil, even as we try to, to cast demons and um, enter into spiritual warfare. I've been enjoying greatly, Bishop, when you have elaborated on the levels of authority. And um, I was enjoying because this is, you have been teaching us administrative processes and administrative law. And um, what I want to bring out also is about when Bishop said that when you operate outside of authority, you, you, for you to operate, to, to operate in authority, you must be under authority. And uh, 
I was reminded of several, several principles that we have in law. Uh, one which is you, can, you cannot operate ultraviolence. Uh, what happens is when you operate ultraviolence, uh, your, your power is quashed, is either quashed or it is uh, your order to, to, to do something or it is prohibited. Whatever you want to say will be prohibited. For example, the seven sons of Skeva, when they tried to order something, to order to bring out, uh, to, to bring out power, they were asked under which authority. They were asked. Demons had to get back and quash their order. That under which authority? We know Paul that you've mentioned. We know Jesus that you've mentioned. But who are you? We lose, we lose um, authority when we don't operate under authority. And that is uh, what we call a traverse, that if you do not work within the set, uh, set rules that you, you, you can do this, you can sign this, you are able to do this and that, but not this. If you exceed, if you exceed your powers, then whatever you, you intend to do will be quashed, will not apply. Whatever you want to do will not apply. So even when he was teaching about delegated authority, I was reminded of the day uh, Elisha uh, asked his servant to carry the, the, the rod to go and resurrect the child of, uh, we know that story. I, I don't want to dwell on that, but Elisha told Gehaz to go with the rod. And Gehaz came back without having uh, done what he, he, he was asked to do. Why? Because he literally had no authority and power at that time. As Bishop has said that it took 30 years for Jesus gaining obedience and he served under authority. So when he came back, Elisha asked why he goes and does exactly what he's supposed to do because he had been delegated. So it, there's a, a, a principle that says that a, a, delegate, a delegate cannot delegate. So what I realized today and last week is we must understand how much authority have I been given? We must respect authority above us. We must operate within such authorities. We will be very safe to pray. We will be very safe to, to cast demons if only and if we have understood the authority above us, we have understood the sovereign or imperial authority. We have understood the veracious authority, which is the truth. We have understood the authority of the conscious, conscious which is um, what I regard as internal policing, the, the, that internal police officer. And even after understanding the customs and traditional authority, uh, like I, I was looking at the custom and traditional authority when, when, when Laban said that our customs does not, our customs does not permit uh, a young child, a young girl to leave or to get married before the elder one. So I have been following since last week and I'm like, God, how easy can it be for me if I just pursue this direction and I'll be covered and I'll know what to do 
and I'll seek to hear from the above that I can know how much I'm supposed to do. So if we can meditate on these lessons, it is possible that we will never suffer such backlashes, we will never such, uh, suffer uh, setbacks in our ministries where you, you move three steps, then you see four steps back, then you, 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 you get uh, as, as someone gets saved in your church and then the next day your child is sick. You see something that is happening, every time there is a positive, there is immediately a negative on the other side. So thank you so much, Bishop. I have learned a lot and I'm still learning uh, and I'm enjoying. Thank you. Now, thank you so much, Pastor Evelyn. Now let's hear uh, uh, Nalongo Rosette, Julia. We have also here um, Moanguzi says, How come uh, have come to a clear understanding between power and authority? The present and the coming generation of ministers need to be taught deeply about such wealth of words found in this topic. Understanding authority relieves one of latent struggling with casting demons always. Stay blessed, Bishop. That one was uh, appreciating. That was Peter Mwanguzi. Now, Longo, Julia. Praise God. Uh, mine is just a request. Uh, if this teaching could be posted on, or we could repeat the teaching because we need to hear and hear. Uh, when Bishop was teaching, uh, my spirit was speaking to me. Uh, there are some things that, that, that I've learned and I'm continuously learning. So we, tomorrow and uh, next week, we need to hear more of this. This is the challenge that we get even in marriages, in every sphere of our lives. This is what really fails us, submission. Thank you so much, Bishop. God bless you. Uh, yes, very many concur with you because one of the statements Bishop has put here is that Satan doesn't fear power. And yes, for us human we are gonna power, we have power. Certain fears, authority, and Satan wants you to move away from being under authority. And he has been very successful. Where we see many people once they get this run, this run told, he runs away and goes to another church and is actually a, going in a situation which is so unprotected. So I concur with the Nalongo Njuya that we need to hear this more and more. Theodora. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, I am, sorry, I am quite young and I'm starting out. I am, I'm the type of person who doesn't have much authority or has not been given a lot of responsibility yet as I start out into the world. And I was wondering, how does one from the beginning as a younger person start seeking out this um, submission to authority? Um, how can one start preparing themselves for it? And I hope Bishop has had you. Here we have Johnson Opolot, he's asking, what does Satan have, authority or power? And if he has any, from who? Bishop, maybe you could respond to this too fast. For a young person, you'll be like Jesus was. Jesus grew in obedience. Your, your first preoccupation should not be exercising authority. Your preoccupation should be to look for people who are in authority so that you can serve them. That is how God expects you as a young person 
to spend the first parts of your life. As I mentioned earlier, that if it took Jesus 30 years, the whole 30 years, you can imagine, Jesus wasn't committing any sin, but for him to be perfected in obedience, it took him 30 years. Some people, when you, they hear that, they say, but you see, with God, if you are well prepared, you will accomplish much more. So the, the most important part of your life is this one, this, this, this uh, uh, paragraph. Find those with authority and submit under them. That is the very important thing. You need to get under divine authority to function properly and be protected. This is, don't, don't first look for power. Don't look for, most people come, concentrate so much, my ministry, my ministry. Initially, God is interested in not so much your ministry as it is your submission. Your submission is the most important part. Look at Jesus. Where was God's major interest in the first 30 years? Not his ministry. Important as that ministry was, that wasn't God's priority. If Jesus was like that, how about us? So it's obvious that all these great men, including Paul and others, Paul spent the first part of his life, all those years, in seclusion. He had had already many, many years of trainings in scriptures. As a Jew, he had to memorize most of the Old Testament. So by the time he gets into ministry, by the time he gets saved on the road to Damascus, he has already committed the scriptures to memory. But when he started to preach, his character had not changed. So the church had to send him to Tarsus and spent many years in the wilderness so that these scriptures may be internalized. The Holy Spirit may change him. And then he goes back now, he has to learn to obey. He obeyed the church in Jerusalem. He obeyed the other leaders in Antioch. It's then that the Holy Spirit said, separate for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them. So notice, there that he had already separated him. He was already an apostle by calling, but it took many years for him to enter into that ministry. He did not become an apostle immediately in Damascus. Uh, no, many years passed. So you can see that many, many of us want to jump that thing and concentrate more on my ministry. The moment your, 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 your CD sells, yeah, you come up with a, a song and a CD. You want the church immediately to recognize this great woman of God, this great man of God, whose CD is a uh, hot cake in time. You want to be a celeb. All of a sudden, and so many celebs enter, end up being casualties because the character wasn't yet ready. They rise so high before the character to sustain them there is ready. So your main Focus now should not be which ministry God has called me for. I hear in the world, people are saying, look for your gift. The gifts are already there. You don't even need to look for, look for them. They, are, they, they automatically come out. What you need more or most is to look for the right authority to submit under. Look for the authority to submit. And first look for the church where you go. Obey that pastor there. Some you, you, you excel in obedience. Just learn to obey. When he wakes you up at 11, wake up, wake up, you, you wake up, uh, come and do this. You, you know, you, you learn to, to let go of your feelings, of your rights, of you, you let them down, you learn to obey. Obey. The issue is learning to obey. And learning to obey, Jesus said, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. When you wake up in a deep sleep, you suffer. You don't like to get out of bed. You, you know, the, but you've learned. You say, no, this is my pastor. He has called me. Let me go. Those, those are kind of things. You learn to, to be pliable, 
to change your priorities. You, you are going to town and the pastor said, no, you remain here. You change your, your program. All those things are a part and parcel. How, how, how ready am I to surrender my program in order to obey? Those are small, small things, but that's how God teaches you obedience. You learn obedience through the things that you suffer. The suffering is a part, part, part and parcel. Okay, then the other question uh, uh, about Satan. Satan has power, but he has no authority. On earth, he, the only authority he's using is the authority human beings have given him. So Satan has power, but no authority because the authority on earth was given to man. If there is no man on earth to, to give him any authority, Satan has nothing. That's why in the Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, just one angel will get hold of him in one hand and the key on the second, and the devil had, will be, have no authority whatsoever when all human beings have withdrawn their, uh, uh, their, their authority. The only authority Satan and demons are using here is the, the authority that human beings have given him. It's human beings who have authority on earth. That's why Jesus, every time he was questioned, he would refer to himself as a son of man. The son of man has authority. The son of man, the son of man, the son of man. The son of man indicating that I came as the son of Adam and therefore I have authority. I've been, as long as I'm obedient and submissive to God, to the veracious, to the, to the sovereign authority of God, to the veracious authority, and my, then I can exercise authority on earth. That's why he quoted, I am the son of man, uh, the son of man. The son of man has authority. You go look for that word in the gospels and you'll find Jesus emphasizing the fact that he is a son of man and exercising that authority in that capacity, not as a son of God. He didn't use that. He left that in heaven. He did not use any of those. He only used the authority that we also can use as human beings because only human beings have authority on earth. Not even God is going to uh, uh, violate that principle. God does not violate that principle. Angels don't have authority on earth. They come, salute, deliver the message, go back. They have no authority here. Angels don't have authority on earth. Spirits don't have authority on earth. Only human beings do. That's why we cast out demons because they don't have authority to operate on earth, except that which is given to them by human beings. So that, that is the matter of authority. We will need to continue to discuss it, to understand it, but that our time is done. God bless you. Thank you so much, dear Bishop. Finally, here is uh, Infinix asking, what if I submit to a pastor? I realize that pastor doesn't submit to anybody. And earlier you need to go to God in prayer because then God has to guide you because once that somebody is like that, very soon he'll go off. Like, look at David, look at Jonathan. Jonathan understood that his father had gone off, but he continued in a wrong camp and ended up dying with his father and other siblings on Mount Gilboa. Jonathan was a very good man but he did not learn to sense the move of the spirit. He knew it. He said, David, you are going to be king of Israel and I'll be with you. I cannot let my father kill you because he noticed that his father was in rebellion against God. God's spirit had moved away from him, but he, he remained in the wrong camp and he ended up losing his own life and losing uh, uh, the calling of God. He sure would have been with, uh, uh, with what? With the, he should have been with David. David was so happy with uh, 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 Jonathan, but he did not, he continued in the wrong 
place. And, and he remained there so long that he ended up losing his life. It wasn't the will of God. So that's it. Jonathan is a good example of somebody who was a very good man, who had very good intentions because the moment he quickly realized that God was with, uh, with David, immediately sided with David, but he never went ahead. He continued to enjoy uh, Amalaundi in the state house, in the palace, in the what, when the Lord had already moved. And so he ended up losing his life and leaving a lame seed, uh, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the only survivor of Jonathan. Uh, and, and so Jonathan had no uh, uh, legacy to leave behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop. Another question will be handled tomorrow by SK. Uh, we'll look at that tomorrow. Beloved, you all are witness. We are so grateful to God for the way he has taught us. And let's meditate over this. We are promised we are continuing from here tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday. We shall have the same time from 7 p.m. to 9. May the Lord bless you even as we pray.